All right, uh, welcome back to another episode here on the MedTech Talent Lab. I am your host, Mitch Robbins, and I'm the founder and managing director here at the Anthony Michael Group, where we help organizations across the life sciences to build best in class teams, primarily in technical areas, areas like regulatory affairs, quality, engineering, et cetera. Uh, I'm honored that today's guest has decided to join us. Um, it's uh, Mr. Ed Nathanson. I think of Ed as a talent branding guru and certainly hold him uh, in very high regard. Let me give you a little bit about his background. So over the last 30 plus years, Ed has built a storied career holding multiple different types of roles within the recruiting, human resources, talent acquisition, and talent branding space. From 2014 until 2020, he built an organization called Red Pill Talent, which as a company had the singular mission to help companies be awesome at hiring. Ed and his team helped clients build world-class internal recruiting and employment branding functions to attract and hire the best possible talent. Ed's been featured multiple times, both as a featured speaker or as the keynote speaker with companies like LinkedIn, Glassdoor, and MassBio, just to name a few. In his current role as the Vice President of Talent and Talent Branding at EQRX, he's building and leading a team that is responsible for executing cutting edge talent attraction and retention strategies as EQRX continues to scale. And for those of you unfamiliar with the company, EQRX is really at the forefront of a revolution. The company is working to make medicines more affordable for people who need them, working to make drug pricing transparent, and reinstating the trust between the pharma pharmaceutical industry and its patients. Without further ado, Ed, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm pumped to be here. Let's rock. Awesome. Well, listen, like I said, it means a lot that you are here because I've been following your stuff for, for some time now, and I reached out to you on purpose because we're talking about a really important topic today, which is right within your wheelhouse, and that is talent branding, talent attraction. But before we dig into some of the nuggets I know that you're going to share today, I'd love if you would tell our audience a bit more about yourself, why this is such a passion for yours, and uh, we'll kind of roll from there. Yeah. Because I know that, you know, this kind of was my, you know, building blocks for you as you've gotten to where you are today. But at the foundation, this is truly a passion of yours. Yeah. So, you know, much like everyone in our organization, I'd say probably 90 percent. I kind of fell into it uh, after college. I was an English. I don't there's no there's no degree to do this. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's no math in school. So um, I had this aspirations to do stand up comedy. And so I, after graduating college, moved to California, gave myself a little over a year. Obviously, I'm here talking to you now. So that didn't work. Uh, but I ended up coming back and I was like, what do I do? What do I what do I like to do? And I'm not ashamed to admit it through my mother, I was introduced to a staffing firm and fell in love with recruiting, fell in love with the communication aspects of it, and was lucky enough to get that training and then moved in-house and started my career in tech for like the first 15, 16 years of my career in a lot of fast-growing technology companies. I was working in a basement with Constant Contact when they were just formed, and now they're a big public company. I was got fortunate enough to be with a company like Rapid7 that started. I was with them from 100 to about 800 people. They're now a big public company. I've really gotten very fortunate in my career to land where I have. Um, and about hmm, at near the end of my time at Rapid7 was really when I started in Kronos, I should say before that I was helping lead Kron recruiting at Kronos, big, large software company. Um, I started to see, this was before employer branding, talent branding was a thing. I started to see the power of brand in, a, in, an organ, in a world where it was desperately needed and no one seemed to think about it. Remember, this is the time of like newspaper ads, really. I'm going to date myself. Uh, um, and, you know, you would put an ad in the, in the newspapers or you would post a job on monster.com and, and, you know, sit back and put your feet up and let the good times roll. Well, mm -hmm. as the talent market got tighter, the challenge became greater and everyone started to look and feel the same. There was no real reason for people to choose one place over the other, except for commute, location, you know, compensation, maybe title. Um, outside of that, you know, I think a lot of the things that matter to a person in their job seeking and their job journey and their career journey was missing. And I philosophically have always believed this, Mitch, that outside of marriage and children, there is no more important, no more emotional, no more impactful decision in someone's life 
Think about it. What's the first or second question you ask when you meet somebody? What do you do? Where do you do it? It's literally outside of husband, father, brother, mother, sister, wife, how we identify ourselves in society. It is absolutely not a transaction. And so we started to play around with it at Kronos. And then when I got to Rapid7, they basically said, you know, all these crazy ideas I had, they said, go play with it and do it and have fun. And what was awesome is, is we did do some crazy things from like straight up movie parodies of doing everything from like having one of our salespeople wear a wig and dance like flash dance around our office, right? To Maniac, if you've seen the movie, to other things. And just like, you know, really going out there and putting things out there from a marketing and branding perspective, which garnered us not only success and being able to scale really fast in a very crowded market, but also to get the attention of some international firms like LinkedIn. And LinkedIn saw the, what we were doing and they thought it was cool. And they gave me an opportunity to keynote in front of 5,000 plus people in Las Vegas. Terrifying, um, probably the scariest moment of my career. But after doing that at that talk, um, I was able to, you know, have a lot of companies come up to me after and say, hey, what you did for them, how did you do that? Could you do that with us? Which led me to ultimately start Red Pill Talent. And you know, they say, create the job you always wanted to do. Well, that was kind of it. It was like, all right, I, I was bored with a lot of the other stuff. And I was like, all right, this is the stuff that really interests me. And so that's what I did for six years, working with big multinationals as big as Cisco was my client. Lots, that's where I started to get into bio. So working with companies like Sage Therapeutics, Bluebird Bio, Foundation Medicine, some of the third rock ventures portfolio of companies, all of these and it was just super exciting and exhilarating, which ultimately led me to where I am now. That's amazing. I, I love that story because had you guys not take, had the organization not giving you the leeway to try some of the things that strategies that you were thinking of, LinkedIn never would have saw it. You never would have been the speaker. You never would have had your consulting business. You per, perhaps weren't going to be at EQRX because if I'm not mistaken, the founders of the, or the executives of the company basically sought you out because they, they were your client at one point, correct? A hundred percent. So some of the founding team at EQRX comes from Foundation Medicine. They were my very first biotech client. And as I'm sure you know, in your business, there's this misguided belief in life sciences that if you don't come from our space, how could you possibly understand our space or help us? Yeah. And, you know, I'd always had an interest, you know, living here in Massachusetts, I basically live in the Silicon Valley of life sciences, yeah. right? Yep, <laughs> you know, especially in Cambridge. Um, so it was always something of interest to me, but I never really sought it out. And when I started my business, um, I was approached by the recruiting leader at Foundation Medicine, and she introduced me to the comms people and some of the executive team. And they were really a very daring organization at the time to kind of take a risk because we both know how conservative our industry can be. Um, and they immediately saw some results because they were doing something different and they were doing something genuine. And they were really turning towards what I believe real branding is, is you can't be anything and everything to everybody. You've got to own what you are, wear it loud and proud. And if some people love it, they're going to love it. And if some people hate it, that's great. I'd rather have them opt out before they even hit apply, right? Or yeah. get into a conversation. And so, yes, long story short, some of the founders then left. And when they left Foundation Medicine, were part of the founding team at EQRX and um, approached me. And while I was loving my business six years, it was a mission I just couldn't say no to. I just, it was irresistible to me. That's, yeah, it's amazing stuff. And I think honestly, right as you were uh, starting to uh, think about making that or about to make that transition and put it online is when I started seeing more and more of your stuff. And the yeah. amount of engagement that you get on LinkedIn is it's amazing. And so I started to see that I'm like, this guy's up to something. And I started to notice, you know what, he's really doing it the way I believe it should be done. And it's just out there. It's it's all value add. It's really great stuff. Story based. Um, I want to stop for a minute and help you, have you define for us and for the audience. What does it mean when we say talent branding or employer branding? And I ask you this because I think it's a, a buzz term lately, but I don't think people necessarily know what they're throwing around. And oh, it'd be 100%. great if you if you kind of give us your take on it. Yeah, it's become almost, um, you know, generic business speak, like, you know, let's all circle back and whatever. It's like these, these terms that <laughs> we all throw in. Right. 
<laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so I first of all, I think employer branding and talent branding, each of themselves are two different things, right? And so we'll use the terms differently and how I define them and what I truly think they mean. Employer branding means how you market and position the employer as an employer of choice. So that's what you say from the account perspective, from the perspective of the company, not the individual, but the company. So if I was marketing you know, EQRX as an employer, that would be employer branding. What EQRX says on our website, on video, on PR, on social media, all of those as official EQRX. Talent branding is amplifying, extending, and enabling the voice of the individual, the talent. Right. There's a whole bunch of studies out there. One of my favorite is the Edelman Trust Barometer, which comes out every year. And it's year in, year out, enables and supports the theory that, and by data of survey, finds that people are three times more likely to trust an individual versus a company or an executive of the company. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, if you amplify the talent, the talent branding, and allow them to speak not as, uh, I like to say, corporate lobotomized individuals, but as naturally in, as who they are individuals and enable them to speak that way. What's happening if you do that in concert with the employer brand, then it becomes an intoxicating mix. So the way I'll put it to a mix that maybe you'll, uh, words that maybe you'll under, your, your um, listeners will understand a lot easier is think of Yelp, okay? So you want to go out to a nice dinner. And you go online and you look around, you see a website where they have the most beautiful steaks and you see pictures of people, beautiful people sitting outside in a gorgeous setting with, you know, with wine. And on their Instagram, they're showing beautiful pictures of their dishes. All right, that's great. So then you want to, in the world we live in today, you always want to validate now. So you're like, okay, is that real? So now I'm going to go to Yelp and I'm going to go to Yelp. And if people are saying the same thing, I can almost guarantee you're going. And if you don't go that night, you're going eventually. If people are saying something different, I can also guarantee that's going to affect your decision if you want to go or not. So think about that aspect in an employer. Employers always going to say, I don't care what company or what industry, they're always going to say, it's awesome to work here. We have throw in, you know, business cliche here. We're transparent. <coughs> Excuse me. Be your best self. All those things. But if the people, the actual consumers, excuse me, of the product, aren't saying it, that's also going to affect it. And, you know, what's different between today, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got something stuck in my throat. What's different between today and five years ago, 10 years ago in the job market is not only is there more opportunity than there's ever been, but there's more information than there's mm -hmm. ever been. Mm -hmm. And people are using it. And so if you think for a second, that someone's going to take your word as a recruiter or as an employer without doing their own digital journey, you are sorely, sorely mistaken. I love, I love that how you define the difference between employer, <clears throat> excuse me, employer branding and and talent branding. <clears throat> Tagging on to what you just said, as far as you know, you're sorely mistaken if you don't think that people are going to go on their own digital journey yeah. versus taking the word. You're right. We are information based society now everything's available everything and everything. stuff that you probably don't want to be available it's For there sure. and those who are savvy will find it so elaborate more on what you see has changed in the last 18 months or so when it comes to the talent market and how companies um how companies need to be engaging with talent to what what they're actually responding to and what they're not responding to yeah. So this is something that I'm incredibly, you know, I think these last 18 months have really amplified a belief I've had all along is that uh, I'm going to quote Shaquille O'Neal here and say, you can't fake the funk on a nasty dunk. Right. Which we, <laughs> and I'm right. going to, and I'm going to take that vernacular and, and, and talk to you about it in a way that, you know, hopefully make more sense. Um, a lot of companies, particularly when COVID hit, um, started to place even more safe than they already had, which is we're going to check the box and say we're transparent. Here's the box where we say we're diverse. Here's the box where we say we're innovative. Here's the box, again, insert cliche after cliche after cliche. Yeah. 
when everyone is digital, when the last 18 months have basically forced everyone to be digital, right? There's no, I mean, we've all worked, even now you and I are talking virtual. Every conversation has been virtual. You, are, you start to melt away into the sea of everybody else, right? If you're just talking corporate gobbledygook speak with no, you know, human interaction, no human being, no human voice as a part of it, well, you don't stand out. You don't make a difference. And so I, over this past 18 months, saw the, the companies that embraced, including EQRX, that embraced being genuine. I hate the term, I know, um, authentic, but I mean it. Authentic to who they are and, you know, weird quirks and all are the ones that really started to stand out and really become human. So there's a philosophy that I've prescribed to for years. So every year, at the end of the year, I study, just just because I'm a nerd, I study on social media the most popular posts on every medium there is, from social from social media to Muse to you name it. All, all of these places, videos on YouTube, I like to look at what engaged, what got people to resonate with it. And every year, year after year, it is the same thing. It's the same pattern over and over. And I call it humor or heart. If it doesn't make you laugh or make you feel, and heart doesn't necessarily mean happy. It can mean sad. It can be angry. But if it doesn't elicit emotion or make you laugh, the data bears it out. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. It's unbelievable how true that is. I guarantee you, I'll throw out a post right now that was on, and I guarantee you saw it. And if you didn't, it's going to be in your feed today. There was yep. one, the uh, gentleman got accepted to law school, and his mother was behind him. Oh, I've Did seen it, it a million times. Millions yeah. and millions yeah. of views. Yeah. Yeah. Millions of views. Yeah. So it's dead, a dead on example of what you're saying. Exactly. And people try to over engineer this. And particularly, they're so concerned about brand and, and how we appear and how buttoned up we look and how glossy we look. People don't respond to that. They just don't. Especially, yeah. as I mentioned earlier, no one wants to feel like they're part of a collective as much as they want to feel like an individual part of a team. And, and a job, as I said earlier, is an incredibly emotional, impactful decision in someone's life and identifying Mark in society. When you dehumanize that, which is what most companies have done, is particularly during COVID because they're playing super duper 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 safe, it doesn't become appealing. It actually becomes less appealing to people who are out there looking to, to do something such so meaningful in their lives as their career. So especially now when you amplify that in bio, which I don't need to tell you how hyper competitive it's been. And for those of you listening who aren't part of our world that we operate in, COVID really hasn't affected hiring in a lot of regards. As a matter of fact, I'd, I'd argue in some instances, it's gotten even a better talent market for people over this period of time. Um, and so when people have options, when people, met, most of these people are not looking, there's a joke up here in Cambridge, you can't walk five feet in Kendall Square without being offered a job at some biotech company, it's right? True. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's, 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 you've got to, You've, to, to really make a difference with talent, you've got to just wear who you are loud and proud. There's a, you know, I'm a geek and I loved Game of Thrones. I don't know if you watched the show, but um, in the very season, first season, Tyrion character says to Jon Snow a quote that I really love, and I'm paraphrasing, but he says, wear what you are like armor. That way the world can never hurt you. And I truly believe the best brands do just that. And I try to do that always with myself. Honestly, I could care less what people think of me. Right. I, if you know, and I know with all the nerdy and weird stuff I put out there, because that's me, some people are like, this guy is crazy. Who is this person? But the people who dig it, well, they tend to like me and they feel like they know me better. But right? that goes back to you can't be everything to everybody. Bingo. So that's Bingo. Exactly. And that's a scary proposition for a yeah. lot of people I know. and particularly yep. companies. Yep. So, you, man, you keep, you're bringing so much gold to this, and I want to kind of reiterate a few of the things that you said. One is humanizing and being genuine and being authentic, and you're so dead on, especially in life sciences, how corporate it can be and how, oh. you know, no pun intended, but in a way how sterile it can feel. And one thing <clears throat> that is hands down something that you guys are doing on a regular basis is humanizing. All you have to do is go to your website and you'll feel it right from the first page, from the homepage. 
you go on LinkedIn, you guys are constantly featuring employees telling their own stories. I don't want to take yep. away your thunder because I want you to share some of the things that are really working well for you guys. The point is, is that you're dead on with the more genuine, the more authentic it could be that these are real people, real lives, real human beings. They're not just corporate employees. The more I think naturally talent gravitates towards feeling like, hey, these kind, of, these people kind of, it's kind of like me in my, in my life versus 100%. feeling like it's um, intangible in a way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Look, you know, at the end of the day, all things being equal, what's going to make someone choose company A over company B is what it means to me. Right. What ultimately, you know, everyone wants to get paid. Everyone wants to have good benefits, all of that. But at the end of the day, people choose one opportunity or another because of the what's in it for me factor. Right. And as the world becomes comes more to your point in the world of bio it's very sterile it's very buttoned up it's very corporate um you know coming from tech i'll tell you and i've said this you know to many people so it's not something i'm afraid to say publicly um i was shocked at how behind bio was from tech in so many ways um not just what we're talking about but culture and 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 all of these things that are just like commonplace now in tech bio has been very slow to get to and so when I think about, you know, all of these things and, you know, particular about how do you brand something to, to, to get people excited about your company, but do it in a way that you're not promoting something that isn't real. Well, the best way to do that is to let your people actually talk. One of the first things I do at my company with every employee, I don't care who they are, first week they're meeting with me and my colleague for an hour and a half. And we are going over social media training with every employee. And we try to tell them, you know, unlike everywhere you have ever been, we actually would love it if you want to be on social media, right? Just the opposite, right? Now, if you don't want to, totally fine. You know, we say be you at AQ, we mean it, right? If you don't want to, we still love you. But if you want to, not only do we love it, we'd love to help you. And here's how. And for the next hour or so, I go over how to make your LinkedIn profile amplified, how to work the algorithms to get people to come to find you. How do you make good content? How do you take photos? All, all of this. We even do a brand ambassador contest every quarter that our president announces at our all-hand meetings, where we announce very publicly the person who's social sharing the best every wow. quarter, right? And, and these are things that, you know... I like to make the analogy of they're like, you know, kittens who didn't have a loving home, right? And they come into us and they're like, you mean I can do this? And they're like, yes, run free, run free, right? <laughs> yeah. No, truly we do. And sometimes you have to keep pushing until they're comfortable saying, no, no, really, it's okay. It is. Um, when you do that, you know, then you also start to get other behaviors or people feel more comfortable sharing their story because they see their peers doing it, right? And so, you know, there's nothing better. There's no story I could come up with that would be better than the people who are actually living it. So we do that. And then think about it from a retention level for a second, Mitch. So we're always focused on the, you know, getting them in. But if I were to get up in front of our company and say, Mitch, you're our employee of the month. Oh, my God, you did X, Y, and Z. You're awesome. You did all of this. That's great. And you're going to feel awesome about yourself and your peers are going to feel like, wow, they really appreciate Mitch. But what if I not only did that, but then told the world that externally? And I said, Mitch is awesome. Mitch did all of this. Well, now the audience gets much, much bigger. Mm -hmm. It's something you can share with people that isn't part of your inside those four walls, whether digitally or, or physically. And that is the biggest love letter you could give someone publicly to say, we appreciate you. Absolutely. People love that. Absolutely. And I, I continuously send out LinkedIn invitations to people who I see recognizing their own team publicly because I yeah. think it's amazing. And I think it's huge, not only just for goodwill, but a great strategy too, right? Wow, this company really values their employees. They, yeah. This company's got a fantastic inviting culture. You know, you said something about rewarding people for being part of the social media and being part of being a brand yeah. ambassador. You know, I think a lot of people hear talent branding or employer branding. They think, oh no, we got to get a marketing team and they got to start creating, you know, these posts and put up, you know, pictures and a, this type of post on Mondays and this type of post on Wednesdays, not realizing that you literally can go on, tell a personal story about what happened during your day. And that's going to get way more attention than a corporate post. I have such an example for you of this. You're so right. 
Um, so a big Fortune 500 company who I will not name uh, to protect the guilty uh, <laughs> um, had engaged with me and back in my days of my business. And their marketing team was deathly afraid of everything that I'm talking about right now. Okay. And we had come up with this great plan with the, the HR team. And they said, no way. You can do that stuff on Instagram. There's no way you're doing that as us on LinkedIn. I said, okay, let me, can I just get one post? One post. And if it does well, you know, we can talk. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. We'll never bother you again. So up until that point, they were averaging their huge company. They were averaging about 500,000 views per impression, which for a company their size, believe it or not, wasn't that great. Um, and I remember there was a birthday going on in the office when I was there. And so I said, hey, hey, everybody get together. Let's take a picture. You know, night near the cake. Everyone's having fun, much more relaxed, taken on an iPhone. We posted that picture as our one picture. It got a million and a half views. The engagement rate was almost 10 percent, which compared to theirs typically was around two and a half percent. Wow. And if you know anything about engagement, ten percent is ridiculous. Um, Huge. And and I showed them. I said, "This is just off the cuff, just to show you." Again, people want to see other people. They don't sign up to be marketing gobbledygook in front of you, curated to the nth degree, sterilized. You know, non. Again, humor or heart. Who couldn't relate to that? Your your example of the mother and the child getting into law school. Who didn't feel some sense of joy? Mm -hmm. Do you remember Chewbacca mom? Do you remember that one? The mom who put the Chewbacca mask on? I do, yes, I do yes. remember. One of the most popular videos in the history of in the internet. Like yeah. literally, it's, last I checked, it was in the billions of views. Wow. Um, now this is again, the reason why is not because it was hysterical, although it was funny. It's because who couldn't experience that joy of this woman having fun laughing with a Chewbacca mask, yeah. right? No People kidding. over engineer <laughs> People, it's true, but people over-engineer this stuff. If you just take away at its core to what we as human beings respond to, again, humor or heart, right? Yep. People absolutely yep. respond to it. You know, everyone wants to position themselves as this all-knowing guru who's just dispensing advice and so on and so forth. If you ever go on my Twitter, I mock it all day long, right? I'm making fun of it, right? And again, I'm sure there's some people like, what a jerk. That's fine. I'm cool with that. <laughs> But the people who get it, they're my peeps, right? And I'm their That's person, exactly right. right? That's exactly right. Um, and uh, yeah, we need to harp on that more is that you can't please everybody. And you're not, no. you're not there to please people. You're supposed to figure out what is your avatar? Why is it your avatar? Meaning, who is the target? Who, what type of people belong in the company? Who, who thrives in the company? And how can we expand that by everything that we do? I see, yeah, I'll even take it a step further. So remember, I mentioned the social media training. Part of it is an extensive LinkedIn profile training with everyone who joins the company. And again, they don't have to do it. I say, if you're not interested, ignore everything I'm about to say. It's your profile, not ours or mine. But one of the things I tell them at the beginning is, is that everything you put on here, I want you to think about who's coming to my page. What do I want them to know about me? It is the one place on the internet that is 100% yours, unless you have your own website. It yep. is your digital business billboard to the world. Yep. What do you want people to know about you? And that's a simple act of just your LinkedIn profile. But when you think about, well, I'm going to expand, I'm going to start putting myself out there more and more. Don't overthink it. Just be yourself. You know, Be yourself and understand what do I want to get out of this and what do I want people to know about me? That's it. And I always say, like it or not, everybody has a brand. So if you, oh, have yeah. not, if you have nothing on your profile, that says something. If you have the wrong stuff on there, it says another thing. So it's up 100%. to you what you want it to say, because either way, it's going to say something. Definitely. Ed, where do you see the, uh, the market continuing to evolve? We're talking about social media. You've got all these you know, new platforms coming out all the time. Yeah. We're, t we're stressing the importance of building some sort of awareness and genuineness for you know, talent for the employer, where do you, how do you see the market continuing to evolve? Yeah. So I think, I think the more raw it's going to get, the better we're going to be. And so I see a lot of companies, as I said, going the other way, but I think tools like, uh, like live broadcast. So we use a tool called social live, 
um, mm. for our live broadcast. We do uh, once a month, we do a, a live with our chief people officer um, called In the Queue. And we talk about just people things like last month, we had a couple of our clinical project managers on talking about being a mom, you know, working virtually what that's been like and all of these things. And then we'll have, you know, different conversations about data science or it's different. It depends. But we're we're doing that, I think, as well. Um, you know, everyone's in love with the shiny new tools. And the new one these days is Clubhouse. I'm an I'm an Android user, so I haven't played with it yet. In full disclosure, I, I'm no Apple fan, but that's a whole nother discussion for another day. <laughs> um, but uh, but, um, you know, uh, I don't necessarily see from what I understand of it, something that I would be seeking out, like I've got to be on there. I do think, you know, you know, the, the old philosophy of thinking about demographics and young people aren't on Instagram or, or this part, you know, older people are on, is gone. That's immediately gone now. I think you throw all that out the window. For example, I look at TikTok is very intriguing, very intriguing. I have a, a friend up here I've known for years. Her name is JT O'Donnell. I say up here, I'm in New England. Um, and she she does a career coaching business. And she was just playing around with TikTok a, a year ago, just doing some career coaching TikToks. Now she's got over a million followers on the platform. Good Morning America just had her on. From a year of, ago? Yes. Good Morning America had her on focusing on her TikToks. You know, she's been in, um, you know, BBC, like all of these functions. And she's gotten a huge traction because of TikTok. If you'd have asked any of myself included, I'd say, oh, that's for kids. My kids use TikTok. And they do. My children do use TikTok. Yep. They're teenagers. But that kind of thinking is is counterintuitive to the companies that are actually going to be out there and do some really interesting things. So what I would say is, is kind of just figure out where your audience is and be there and be there. Right. And 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 don't make assumptions. Ask. When I used to consult, one of the things I would talk to my, I would say to my clients was, I would say, give me 10 to 15% of your employees that you would clone if you could, the best of your best. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, I want as diverse a group of people there too. So I want people not only who are different ages, genders, ethnicities, but people from different backgrounds and also from different times of tenure with the company, people who just joined and people who've been there forever. And I would kick everyone out of the room. I don't survey them because I think nobody's truly honest on surveys. And I would just have conversations with them. Yeah. And some of the questions I would ask is, you know, what's your favorite social channel? What's your first app you go to every day? You know, where do you go to get your news? All different questions like that. And there you start to get real evidence. Ah, and I would always be surprised. I'm not, I won't tell you which one, but I'll never forget one biotech company with Snapchat was just new. Um, I'm in a room with doctors and scientists and Snapchat was their favorite channel by far. Wow. And I would have never have guessed that. You and me Never both. in a million years. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah, you can't go off assumptions. You have to ask. You have to ask. And so that's kind of, um, you know, when I think about new tools or new shiniest I just like to focus my energy on when, where I should be and where my audience is, not where I think we should be, but where the people I want to reach are. And paid media is a whole nother thing we could talk about. Well, so we talked about your consulting business. You worked with a yeah. variety of biotechs. You're in biotech yeah. as it stands today with EQRX. Would you yeah. say overall LinkedIn is still the primary platform that you see audiences gravitating on for this type of situation that we're talking about? Yes, I'm a big yeah. fan of LinkedIn. Although I'm going to say this with a caveat. I think most companies, and I say most, I'm going to do rough ed math, 95% still misuse it terribly because they're so deathly afraid of LinkedIn and what they think they should be on that platform. They think, well, LinkedIn, you have to be buttoned up and, you know, very, you know, you know, hoity-toity and, you know, very business speak. And look at the brands that stand out. Look at the ones that do it. They're not doing that. Yeah. They're not doing that. And a great way to to think about it is reverse engineer what as a as a biotech professional, life sciences professional, med tech, whatever you want to call it, what posts are you engaging with the most? That's right. If you're clicking That's on right. the lawyer who just or the the gentleman who just got into law school with his mother, 
versus the suit who's talking about, you know, molecular bio, whatever it may be, right? <laughs> Why would you think your audience might be different? So here's a here's a point. very fun but silly example. So during during the the pandemic, I've done started a, a YouTube channel with my kids where we review snacks. It's called Family Snack oh. Reviews. Oh, really? From all around the world. Yep. And um and you know it started to catch on a little bit, but every week on Friday I do a post where I share one of those videos it has nothing to do with anything right we're just literally yeah. a dad and his son or a dad and his daughter we do they both mix it up we switch around um tasting snacks and giving our reviews of them and you would think like i'm so guarded why would i let people in why would i do that or any people love it they get great reactions there was a whole debate i did a whole serial episode and people were like oh i'm you know captain crunch over lucky charms any day yeah I'm very serious quote-unquote people like you just gotta be a human when you're actually human, the results are endless. So what? Uh, so what you're telling me is, I'm going to come to your house. Your garage is going to be full of frosted flakes and, <laughs> and, and corn flakes and all these sponsors, right? And we we review this. We review this. We want your kids to do this. That's awesome. Look, Mitch, I've got two teenagers. If this is the way they're going to hang out with me, I'll take it. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. Good for you, man. That's awesome. <laughs> So for those who have listened to um, any of the other episodes on the MedTech Talent Lab or they've tuned into the live edition that we do on Wednesdays on LinkedIn, one of the topics that you know I am feverishly passionate about is job descriptions and what I think companies get wrong with it. I want to ask you your opinion without tainting your answer. Number yeah. one, do they have a place? And number two, how, in your opinion, should they best be utilized? All right. So do they have a place? That depends. I'm going to give you an asterisk on that. Not in the way most companies do them, which is they treat them as HR documents and they're describing a person, not the job. Right. I always say it's a job description. Let's be honest. It's an advertisement. And a lot of what's happened, again, it's been over-engineered. So if you look at EQRXs, for example, we have a template we use, which is what you'll do is the first thing. And it says, literally, this is what you're going to do in this job. This is what this job's doing. The next is the impact you'll have. And again, it says why this role is important. And lastly is your superpowers, which goes to our professional superpowers quiz that we do. And it's it's not you have eight to ten years of this. You're you're an MH, you know, MS and this. And it's you are awesome at this. You've done this before. You can do this, right? One of the things that really drives me bananas is these arbitrary years experience that people throw out. You know, I'm sure you've dealt with this a million times. We need a eight million. Years. Try a billion in one. <laughs> yeah. We need eight years experience of this, right? And it's like, well, how did you come to that number of eight? versus seven or nine right it's just like you know what they're basically saying is i want someone mid-career okay now what happens is if you put eight years experience in a job description people with six are not going to apply they're not thinking they're fit yet if you went back to that same manager who came up with that arbitrary eight years experience and said would you talk to someone with six they'd say yeah sure but you've already eliminated them yeah. right so again it should be about the job not the person and secondly <laughs> People's attention span these days are just not what people think it is. These war and peace job descriptions that are three to four pages long, you know, all of this nonsense, corporate gobbledygook, none of that, you know, they don't resonate. It says a lot about your organization, this advertisement, much more than you think, right? It's consistency of branding. So think about it this way. You see a car commercial on TV, Matthew McConaughey is driving the car. He's looking really cool, right? You get a gloss in the mail, same car. Oh, that looks cool. All right, I'm going to go check it out. I'm going to go to the dealership or in this case to your website to see your job description. If it doesn't match what you saw to get you there, 100 out of 100 times you aren't buying it. You aren't buying it. Same thing. It's consistency of brand. It's consistency of message. And if you think you say, oh, we're fun and we're, we're all this, whatever you're saying, and then you get to a job description and it reads like something from 1960s personnel department, right? And legal and lawyers read it, wrote it, read it, read it. I was an English major, wrote it. <laughs> um, you know, right? Then, then you know, that says something. So again, like, do I think there's a place? Yeah, we like to do a lot of video ones whenever we can show people. You know how to not again not produce not we don't pay people to do them. We literally take a phone and we film themselves saying some things about it. Um, honestly, those perform better too. You know, you when put we a link those. to the video in the description. 
Nope. On, we online, do it, we no. do it as the post and then link to the job. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So but what's going to get people website? to the site? Oh, no, you, no, no, no. We, okay. we use that there. It's to get them to the website. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> you said something that, that uh, makes so much sense. And that is that, yes, there's a place, but companies are using them wrong. And it makes me think about the about section on people's LinkedIn profile. It's yeah. such valuable real estate yes. to say exactly what you want somebody to gleam from being on your page. It's such a critical and useful opportunity, the job description, to talk about your employer value proposition. Why yeah. should somebody who's got the pick of the litter, especially in our world, right, where it is as competitive as it is, and literally a company's a thro stone's throw away from your company with the same job open, Yep. It's such a great opportunity to position your organization with the value proposition that you're offering and speak from what's in it uh, from the vantage point of the candidate. What's in it for them? And that's, that's where right. I love what you say. What are you going to do? What's your impact? And here's your superpowers. Yeah. And when you talk about consistency of brand, all you got to do is look at your stuff, EQRX, the website, what you guys post online, everything that is said about it's all consistent. So you're dead on. It's and you know again, thank you uh, first of all for saying that. But but again, you know it's not it's not rocket science. It's just being you know open and consistent and understanding your audience. That's it. Absolutely. So I want to wrap up with a couple of things. You know, I mentioned earlier that you have had the fortunate opportunity to really be building this team uh, when it comes yeah. to talent attraction, recruiting, branding, etc. And um, with all the emphasis that we've placed on the importance of, of social media as a piece of your branding strategy, I'm curious how you manage your team's performance. Is there a metric that you place on their utilization of social media as part of the recruitment team? Yeah, it's, a, it's an essential part of their job. It's an essential part of their job. Um, when I interview people, when I interviewed people and when I will continue to interview people, I ask them a lot about that and talk to them about that expectation. <laughs> Here's the thing. Think about, picture yourself at night, you're at home and you get a call and it's a number you don't know. Are you answering? No. Of course not. You're a sane human being. No human being would answer that. Same thing here with outreach, with reaching out to people, whether it's an email, a call, a text. If they don't know who you are, and if you're not from a company that they're just like dying to talk to, not everyone could be Google, right? Yeah. Um, why would they answer? And so what social media does is break down what I call the I don't know you factor. The more you put yourself out there, the more you become the I don't know you factor gets chipped away at slowly and slowly and slowly. And the chances of people responding to you increase greater and greater and greater. So. I don't have quotas per se, but they are required to do one vlog per month, right? Where they talk about an issue they choose, what they're comfortable about, that's that's to their audience. So if you've seen the team at um, Rex, they'll talk about things like, should I write a cover letter? You know, how do I prep for an interview? All of these things, because their audience is probably going to be concerned about those things. Mm -hmm. But I also feed, I make it so they don't have to create it themselves. So I have a, a teammate I work with. Her name is Kit. She's fantastic. We work together to create content for them. And we put them in a folder for them. We use Microsoft Teams. We put it in Teams. They can go in there anytime and use them. And as you see, they are very active because they don't have to create it and they add their own color to it, right? I told them, I never want to see you regurgitating anything. You speak how you would speak, right? She Share what you want to share. I'm not going to ever tell you what to share. You share it. You put it out there. And it's 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 enabled them to, when they do reach out, see more success. But also, again, we're a new company. You know, we're only a year and a half old. So awareness is everything. And the more you're out there, the more you're seen, the more they hear EQRX, then the whole I don't know you, not just their individual I don't know you, the I don't know EQRX factor keeps chipping away. Absolutely. I, it's funny. You always hear, I've heard it as the no like and trust factor. You flipped it and said that we're trying to chip away at the I don't know you. How yes. soon can we get it to where it's no longer a fact that they do know yeah. us, right? Yeah. So I love yeah. that. Um, and I love the fact that you do make it a true uh, piece of their job. That, yeah. That's their responsibility because it's in turn making their job easier by people know, like, and trust, right? 
I know. Look, you know, there's a big benefit to them individually too, Mitch. When they're building their brand, that's something that they, hopefully they're with us forever, but they're not going to be, right? Nobody is anymore. So that's something they take with them. Their Huge. brand, their building, their, yep. their positioning themselves as a such a ma subject matter expertise. Look, you know, I know lots of people who are really brilliant, but the world won't know it if they don't share it. Unfortunately, that's the world we live in today. It right? is. Yep. And so, you know, the, everyone's digital. So if you're not part of the digital conversation, I don't know what to say. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like. I know. Like it or not. Right. I always say, right. man, sometimes I wish we didn't even have social media. If I didn't need it for work, I would just take it off. Agreed. But the truth is, it's here, though. It's here. And so we we have to utilize yep. what is here and where people are, like you said. So, Mitch, I'd love to yell at kids to get off my lawn and talk about when burgers cost a nickel, you know, but those, you know, that's not <laughs> exactly. going to get me anywhere. You're climbing up the hill, you know, six miles in the snow to, to, to exactly. school. Exactly. <laughs> Listen, I want to I want to wrap this up by saying a couple things. One, unbelievable content. Thank you so much. It's oh, my amazing pleasure. what you're doing. And I have the utmost regard for you and what you're doing with EQRX. Thank you. Um, and I want to give you the last words to just talk about anything cool that you would like uh, the audience to know as far as what's going on at EQRX and what might be coming up. Yeah. So if you haven't checked out EQRX, I highly recommend you do. You can go to EQRX.com, go to look us up on Glassdoor, comparably all the review sites, but also our LinkedIn page. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. Um, you know, it's it's a very different company in the biotech space. I said earlier, I couldn't say no. Our mission is very simple. We want to make medicine affordable for people who need it. And it's, um, you know, it's just a, it's, if, you know, I like to say this is a potential to do some really good in the world. And it's not unlike, and every biotech is going to say that, every pharma is going to, and they mean it. Um, but ours isn't one specific therapeutic area. It's a global push to make affordable medicine for people who need it. And I wish I could give you all the nooks and crannies, but we're an early stage startup. So I can only just talk in generalities, but say yeah. that I've never been prouder to be a part of a company like this. Well, you've been a part of a lot of them. So for you to say that is obviously a lot of, a lot of cool stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, definitely we'll, we'll make sure to put some information in the show notes so people have a link to check out EQRX. And again, Ed, thank you so much for being here. I really do. Oh, my pleasure, it. Mitch. Thank you.